Sorry. Sorry, guys, I had not gone actually live. Uh, we are live. We are live now. So uh, starting off with the uh, third in the series of the Obstetric Symposium, and today we are going to uh, talk on two uh, interesting topics. Uh, one is PDPH, so it's a very common thing. Sorry, yes, I have not gone actually live. So we are live. We are live now. Okay. So uh, starting off with the uh, third in the series of the Obstetric Symposium, and today we are going to. Uh, talk on two uh, interesting topics. Uh, one is PDPH, so it's a very common thing. Sorry, guys, I've not gone actually live. So we are live, we are live. Sorry, guys, it's, yeah. Okay. Uh, we were supposed to start off with the um, you know, maternal mortality, but uh, I think we're going to, to change the order of the uh, talks. Uh, and uh, the whole symposium is being hosted by Vanilla. So I'm going to hand over to Vanilla so that uh, she can take us through the day. Uh, over to you, Vanilla. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Shiv. It's a great pleasure to start our third obstetric symposium. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to this. I hope the viewers and the participants enjoy this as much as I'm looking forward to it. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Poonam Gotki, a well-known speaker amongst our uh, gas community and anesthetic community. Poonam has been with us as a teaching faculty for some time. She's a consultant anesthetist at Dina Nath Mangeshkar Hospital, Pune. Uh, she has special interest in regional anesthesia, orthopedics, and obstetrics. Over to you, Poonam, on the topic PDPH new modalities. Thank you, Vanila, and thank you, sir. Uh, I welcome you all for the third obstetric symposium. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have already shared my screen, so I hope it is visible. Yeah, yes. go ahead. So, so um, my topic of presentation today is PDPH in obstetrics, the new modalities. Uh, I have now share the second slide. So the slides are moving just to confirm. Yeah. So PDPH in the past was called as post lumbar puncture headache, but soon PDPH took the place. But is this PDPH really because of the dural puncture? Well, with the advances in the electron microscopy and the studies, now it is evident with the ultra structure that dura basically has the dural laminae which are concentric in nature, and it has a high elastic property and connective tissue, which aids in closure of the dural hole after the dural puncture. Whereas in arachnoid, which is basically acting as a barrier, it is less permeable. So the healing does not take place as much early as it does with the dural puncture. So it is thought maybe it is the hole in the arachnoid that is probably responsible for this PDPH, and so some have come with a recent nomenclature as a meningeal puncture headache. However, I'm going to stick to the PDPH not only because it is simple to use, it is also convenient for us and familiar to us. So we will stick to PDPH, but this was just to tell you a new advance in the nomenclature of the entity. Postpartum PDPH, now this being an obstetric symposium, we are going to focus more upon postpartum but why should we exclusively talk about the parturians when we talk about PDPH? Now, when one is doing obstetric practice, cesarean section is the surgery that we are going to do. And spinal anesthesia is the prominent or the most selected anesthesia for these patients where we are going to do an intentional dural puncture. So naturally, the incidence may go high. And the second point is we provide labor analgesia with the epidural route. The reported incidence of PDPH after an accidental dural puncture so the incidence of accidental dural puncture is somewhere between 0.5 to uh, 3%. So amongst this, almost 80%, 50 to 80% may develop PDPH. Reported because there may be many incidences of dural puncture which actually do not get reported. So that high in, is the incidence and that is why we have taken this topic into consideration for our obstetric symposium. Now, if you look into the title of this topic, it is PDPH, the new modalities. So clearly, we are making two assumptions here. First is that the headache that a patient is having, we are assuming that it is nothing but the PDPH. So we are well versed with the clinical features of PDPH, and we are sure that our patient is not having any other kind of headache 
but PDPH. So in a postpartum patient, the headache could be a simple non-specific headache and it could be a severe headache with neurological signs. PDPH is somewhere in between. So we are sure that our patient is suffering from none of these but PDPH. So that is the first assumption. However, we, even if we know the new, uh, the clinical features of PDPH, is there anything new in the definition? So we know that the PDPH presence with the frontooccipital area being more affected, there are associated symptoms, neurological symptoms, and the time. Most important and the pathognomonic feature is the postural component. However, in the new uh, definition by IHS, that is International Headache Society, they have omitted this postural component, which is surprising to us. But what they mean to say is that even if the patient is presenting with all the characteristics of PDPH, and if the postural component is absent, that does not mean that it is not PDPH. So postural component is still pathognomonic, but its absence should not rule out PDPH. So PDPH should always be into your consideration. So that is something new I thought should be included in this talk. The second assumption we are making is that we are going to talk about the new modalities. So we are assuming that we know all the other managements of PDPH. So whenever a patient is diagnosed of PDPH, we would begin with the conservative management, bed rest, hydration, caffeine, or analgesics. So this is the conservative management for PDPH. And if this doesn't work, we all know the definitive treatment is the epidural blood patch. So whatever we are going to discuss henceforth, will lie in a spectrum of these two. So new modalities would be somewhere in between these two. To know or to understand the treatment behind PDPH, we need to know something about the pathophysiology or the etiology. So what does this picture depict? It represents the Monroe Kelly doctrine. So the three components of the cavity, skull cavity, brain tissue, CSF, and the blood. So any loss or decrease in volume of one should be compensated by the other to maintain the equilibrium or the balance. With dural puncture, which is the pathology behind PDPH, the CSF pressure will fall and therefore there will be a compensatory increase in the blood volume that is by the cerebral vasodilatation to maintain the equilibrium. So it is the loss of CSF or the CSF hypotension plus cerebral vasodilatation that is responsible for the headache. So CSF leak, which is the primary pathology. So if you have to treat, you have to seal this leak or plug this leak. You have to give drugs which would either increase the production of the CSF or decrease the absorption. And lastly, you would have to reverse the cerebral vasodilatation. So most of the drugs that we are going to discuss will either increase the production, decrease the absorption, or will reverse this vasodilatation. And the commonly used drug, which is caffeine, will act by reversing this cerebral vasodilatation. Despite of knowing all these, when we take the necessary preventive measures to prevent PDPH, we see that PDPH still occurs. We use pencil point or pencil tip needle, a smaller gauge needle, a midline approach, and we'll take all the necessary precautions, yet PDPH occurs. Now, why that should happen? Oh my God, what is this? Is this by mistake? So it is not. It is a Baton and Horan mobility index. And in a recent issue, it has been found that joint mobility or joint laxity is directly associated with PDPH. So if you remember the first slide where we discussed the ultrastructural uh, features of the arachnoid or the uh, dura matter, it was the connective tissue responsible for healing of the dural hole or the puncture. So when there is any problem with the joint laxity or connective tissue disorders, the healing of the puncture takes time. And there has been an association between the joint laxity and the PDPH. This is in a very recent issue in July, 2023. And so I thought that I might as well include this as an association. So, so many times we see that we have taken all the necessary precautions, yet the patient lines up with the PDPH. So maybe we can look into this cause as well. So coming to the pharmacotherapy. Now, there are n number of drugs that have been studied. People have tried multiple drugs. So I'm going to simply enumerate all those drugs which people have tried. Now, there are certain drugs which themselves cause headache and they have used, they have been used for PDPH. One such example is ondansetron. Now, the only side effect other than its effect on the QT prolongation of ondansetron is the headache. It will precipitate migraine. Yet, uh, that drug has also been used and studied for PDPH. 
so there is a gamut of drugs that have been studied we will just discuss a few drugs amongst these which are easily available to us and which we can use so these could be either for prevention of pdph or for treatment of pdph so first drug is the aminophylline a xanthine derivative so it will reverse it will increase the production of csf so it has been tried for prophylaxis as well as therapeutic purposes prophylaxis has not been shown to be useful therapeutic has been shown to have some promising effect for preventing or treating the pdph so one can use aminophylline now whenever nothing works we give steroids we give dexamethasone we give hydrocortisone similarly for pdph a very short term iv hydrocortisone has been shown to be effective so you could give 100 mg 8 hourly for 2 days that has shown to be effective in the treatment of pdph now we all know how in high altitude the hypoxemia leads to headache so on that ground high flow oxygen has been administered for post uh, post dural puncture headache and it has been found to be effective so it reverses the vasodilatation 12 liters per minute which is high oxygen administered through mask has been shown to improve patients suffering from pdph so that also can be used easily available drug now this drug is not that easily available yet i have included because in this report they presented that patients who were given the definitive treatment in the form of epidural blood patch still were not relieved of the pdph got treated with this drug so it increases the production and also reverses the cerebral vasodilatation and helps in treating the pdph what about reversal there is a lot of um, you know thing you are going on re regarding this reversal of pdph on our group also you must have seen people talking about reversal of pdph now when for reversing the neuromuscular blockade we are trying to kick out uh, neostigmin and replacing with sugamadex neostigmin is fi finding its place in pdph treatment so in what form so addition of neostigmin and atropin to the conventional treatment not as a sole management but as an addition to the conventional treatment has been shown to be effective in treating the pdph so if you go through our group there have been multiple reports now i have selected these two wherein they have used neostigmin and atropin combination for reversing the pdph so here one has used sole neostigmin and atropin combination while in this report uh, langevar madam has used sphenopalatine ganglion block along with the reversal agent with very good results so how do they act so again, two effects, cerebral vasoconstriction, it causes cerebral vasoconstriction, both the drugs, and also the increase the CSF production. Now, neostigmin per se will not cross the blood-brain barrier, but it can freely enter into the choroidal plexus, and it also has some analgesic property. So that is why there are some anecdotal reports of neostigmin being used as an adjuvant to local anesthetic for spinal anesthesia. So that is one of the rationale behind using neostigmin. So it acts two ways, both the drugs. So cerebral vasoconstriction is there. So there is reversal of the dilatation that has occurred and also increase in the CSF production. So what is the dose? So neostigmin, 20 microgram per kg, add atropin to it, 10 microgram per kg, mix this in 100 ml of saline and give over 10 to 15 minutes. So a large clinical trial is already going on on this drug and its effect on reversing the PDPH. So this is something which shows promising effect and which people have been using in our country here and there. Again, there are n number of drugs. So for example, sumatriptan. There is membrane stabilizing agents like the pregabalin or gabapentinoids, xanthinol. If you go through our group, there is a lot of discussion around complemina retard and its use for PDPH. There is this particular tablet called as vasograin, which is used in neuro ICU. It consists of paracetamol, ergotamine, caffeine, and prochlorperazine. So there is an analgesic. There is a drug which will increase the production. There is a drug which will reverse the vasoconstriction and one sedative. So all together, cocktail in one drug. So vasogrin can be used. And then there is a homeopathic treatment also. We use this hypericum in our institute with varied results. Is there any place for regional or PNB for PDPH? Being anesthetist, we always try to give blocks wherever possible. So yes, there is a place for regional anesthesia for PDPH and the most popular one is the sphenopalatine ganglion block. So what is the anatomy of this ganglion? It is a very small ganglion in the pterygopalatine fossa and interestingly it is surrounded by very loose connective tissue of mucous membrane. So 
you just have to deposit the drug in the vicinity of the ganglion you need not target the ganglion per se if the drug is deposited anywhere near the ganglion it will penetrate through the connective tissue which will help in transit of the drug to the ganglion this ganglion has a junction of sensory sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation our point of interest is parasympatholysis because that will reverse the cerebral vasodilatation it can be done as a bedside transnasal approach is the easiest one all you need is a blunt tipped or a cotton tipped applicator and 2 to 3 ml of la in each nostril is enough you could add an adjuvant example dexamethasone to the drug la could be anything it could be lignocaine ropivacaine bupivacaine you can use of your choice the neck should be flexed the head should be extended what is the target it is in between the middle nasal turbinate posteriorly as can be seen in this diagram and the pterygoid canal anteriorly now explaining this procedure to the patients was very difficult in the pre covid era but now it is easier for us to explain it to them because all you have to say is that it is going to be similar to the rt pcr swab and they easily agree so now it is no more uh, considered as an invasive procedure you just tell them it is going to be similar to the rt pcr and they easily agree similarly instead of the cotton tipped applicator you could use a la spray directly into the nose hoping that it will reach the connective tissue and then to the ganglion now people are so much well versed and agreeing to this spino palate and ganglion block that during covid era interestingly i found this article that there has been a self application of the spray by the patients who suffered from pdph so they used to take the spray themselves if they are having a pdph and got relieved so some good thing about the that happened during the covid i should say the next is the greater occipital nerve block we know this block as a component of the scalp block so it is done posteriorly the landmarks are occipital protuberance and the mastoid process medial to one third and lateral two third is the junction the gon can be blocked here if you want to block the lon a slightly lower landmark is there it can be landmark guided you could also use pns uh, local twitching is what is desirable you could also use an ultrasound guided block for this block another one is a nag block this is published by sir in jccr what is it you combine the nerve block and the ganglion block so spino palate and ganglion block and the gon block are combined for treating the pdph and this also has shown promising results so basically you need to have a combination and do not rely upon a single treatment a block with reversal agent or the other drugs plus a block would do wonders so is there anything else in the region anesthesia we spoke about the spg block we spoke about the gon block we don't try to stop here so there has been interesting case report it is really very interesting to use an erector spiny plane block for pdph so it may sound an overwhelming report but just let us go through it so this was done at t4 level for a patient who refused epidural blood patch as a last rescue what it is believed is that when you give esp block at this plane at this point the drug that is injected ascends upwards and blocks the trigeminal cervical complex which is present over there so the drug reaches the upper cervical roots and bathes the complex and provides relief so maybe in austere conditions where you do not or cannot give the ebp and the patient is really suffering from pdph you may try this overwhelming block so this is just to complete the list i don't think i would myself ever give an esp block for pdph coming to epidural blood patch is there anything new now epidural blood patch is the gold standard for pdph so is there anything new in the ebp that we need to know so other than blood there have been various other drugs or materials that have been used for example crystalloids epidural normal saline dextran colloids like hes or gelatin and fibrin glue so amongst this these fibrin glue is shown more promising results interestingly epidural morphine has also been shown to have very good effect in cases of pdph so 3 mg in one day for two days has been shown to have a good result but the study is on a very small population is there any non invasive treatment for pdph now a mother needs to nurse her baby as soon as possible and as many times as possible so pdph can be really devastating if it is frequent and hampering her day to day activities or movements so can we have something which is non invasive so yes there is an indian publication called as the sekhar's dish maneuver but 
This study is in orthopedic patients. I do not know or I don't believe that this can be done in a patient who is just delivered a child. So just to complete the list, I thought that I would include it as a component of the therapy. Now we are talking about the treatment, but what about any prophylactic measures that can be taken if there is an accidental dural puncture? So like we saw, while giving labor analgesia, there has been an incidence of around 0.5 to 3% of accidental dural puncture. And when there is an accidental dural puncture, 50 to 80% of the patients would have or would develop PDPH. So when there is a live ADP or dural puncture, what can be done to prevent the PDPH as a prophylactic measure? So there is an intrathecal catheter placement that can be done, which has shown a very good result. So it is a prophylaxis to PDPH after an accidental dural puncture. You thread in the catheter through the, intra, through the epidural needle into the intrathecal space and leave it for 24 hours. You may or may not use it for analgesia. It is believed that the catheter will initiate an inflammatory reaction for closure of the dural hole. But remember, there is always a risk of aseptic meningitis because you're keeping the catheter in the intrathecal space. And therefore, strict asepsis and strict following up of rules that nobody should touch this catheter other than the anesthetist. So you can apply such flag signs everywhere, so much so that you can have a sticker outside the patient's room that there is an intrathecal catheter in this patient. Nobody is supposed to touch that. So that has been used with very good results. So now let us take an empirical case, a 23 years old primary gravida who underwent LSES for non-progress of labor. A spinal was given by consultant. By consultant, I mean an expert anesthetist, not a trainee with 26 gauge Quinkies needle in a single eight traumatic attempt. The perioperative course was really uneventful. However, on post-operative day two, parturian complaints of headache in the frontoporital area, occipital area that accentuates in sitting position and is relieved on lying down. She's receiving tablet paracetamol round the clock with no relief. There are no other complaints. Means there are no other neurological signs or signs of focal neurological deficits and her vitals are stable. So this, I have emphasized certain points here so that we, it leads to the diagnosis of nothing but PDPH. How do we go about in such a case? So the patient has PDPH. Is it really PDPH? Are there any other flag signs which suggest that it can be something else? For example, there is a thunderclap headache. For example, there is a PIH and you're suspecting that the patient probably has press and the headache is because of press. So in those cases, it is imperative for her to undergo neurological examination. It is important that a neurologist gets involved in the management of such case. But if there are typical characteristics of PDPH, which we saw, what should we do? So we should begin with the conservative management always. Continue this management for 24 to 48 hours and then see what happens. So in this conservative management, you can try using caffeine, hydrocortisone, you can try using oxygen, you can try using aminophylin and drugs of that kind. Then what happens? If she is relieved, she may be discharged. But while discharging, you have to alert her about the alarming signs, which means that if there is a change in the character of headache, if there is a recurrence of headache, if there are other neurological deficits, if there is diplopia, so she should come back if she has all those complaints. However, if there is no relief of by the conservative management and the patient has got intense pain, disabilitating pain, then what to do? The definitive treatment then would be an epidural blood patch only. However, if the patient has a pain, but it is mild to moderate kind of pain, we can offer her the blocks that we discussed, those spinopalatine block, or the GON block or the NAG block. And you can combine this with the reversal agents, that is neostigmine, atropine, or any other drug. So do not rely upon a sole modality. So always combine. After giving this also, if there is no improvement, you have to give the epidural blood patch as the definitive treatment. So this is how you would go about in a patient who develops PDPH. So to summarize my talk, follow up every case of PDPH. So whenever there is a spinal given or there is a patient who has received epidural, even if there is no uh, visualized or witnessed dural puncture, always visit the patient in the post-operative period if there is PDPH because there may be a dural puncture which was not recognized while doing the uh, analgesia procedure. 
always begin with the conservative management. EBP is still the gold standard. Regional block or peripheral nerve blocks may be tried in intense or refractory PDPH, but always combine them with the conservative management. And lastly, counseling and empathy is always important. Like we say, TLC for all ANC patients, tender loving care. So counseling and empathy are important aspects of dealing with the patients with PDPH because most of the times, remember, it is a time-bound phenomena. Even if you do nothing, the PDPH is going to resolve. If it is really PDPH, it is going to resolve by seven days. We intervene so as to make the patient's life easy. She has to nurse a baby. She cannot lie down for a longer time because then there is a risk of PVT. So you have to balance all those things. And therefore, counseling and empathy becomes very, very important. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Thank you, Vanila. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Poonam. That was uh, quite an interesting one, focusing mainly on the recent advances in uh, postural puncture headache. Um, I quite enjoyed the talk. Um, I have a few questions, but uh, uh, before then, I would just uh, ask if uh, the rest of the faculty would like to ask you a comment on your presentation, please. Shiv, Guru, Dr. Kamal. Kamal? Yeah. yeah. You want to add something? Uh, I just wanted to say, um, I recently went to SOAP meeting. And yeah. uh, there they were talking about this neostigmine, uh, yeah. which was the new thing which is coming up, neostigmine and atropine. Um, I have not tried it myself. Um, I'm still waiting to see whether the, the trial which is being conducted at the moment, whether it will show any light. Uh, but that's the one thing which is very uh, promising to me. Uh, I'm not quite sure about this um, spinopelatine ganglion block and... Uh, uh, greater occipital nerve blocks and all. Uh, in UK, there are some centers using them, but the, the results are very variable at the moment. Uh, but in our hospital, uh, we always go for the, if we have confirmed this, uh, one thing I, we always do is we try to tell all the trainees and all the uh, consultants here, if they have accidental dural puncture headache, please put the uh, catheter and treat it as an intrathecal catheter and uh, give antibiotic prophylaxis and make all the uh, preventive measures to um, anyone else is touching the catheter. At the same time, uh, that gives a, definitely that gives advantage of that fibrosis forming and the chances of post puncture headache comes down a lot. So... Have you used epidural... Sorry, I missed part of it. Sorry, sorry so much. Uh, sir, I was asking about your experience of epidural saline. Have you used? Because intrathecal catheter is what we also practice. Suppose there is an accident. So we don't, we don't use at all. We don't use yeah, those things. Because the, the evidence are very patchy at the moment. I, uh, I'm, I did, I did um, uh, some research on this aspect uh, about, some, uh, about when to do the epidural blood patch. I did it a long time ago. I published as well. Uh, whether we do, do it yearly epidural blood patch or late epidural uh, blood patch or delayed epidural blood patch. What that means is, should we do it within 24 to 48 hours or delay for up to 48 hours and then do it? Uh, so again, the studies are very um, patchy and um, the results are not encouraging. We always go for, we, we always give the patient 24 to 48 hours with the conservative management if the patient is willing. If the patient says, no, I am I am happy to take the epidural blood patch, we will go within even after 24 hours, we will go for it. So epidural blood patch does uh, have its own wonders because uh, when patients come to uh, neurological ICU with he heavy headache and uh, the responsible thing is the spontaneous dural tears which happen more commonly on the anterior aspect, we do epidural blood patch from them and it is effective in those cases. But I have not done any epidural blood patch for any of my patients who had PDPH. Most of them started with the conservative management is what I have observed. Um, that, that is true. That, that is true, but it, it varies. Uh, it, again, it is uh, what I understood is, again, it depending upon the patient population, because here patients are very demanding. They, we, we, I have done so many epidural blood patches. Uh, even of even I have done some one of the patient I have done uh, two epidural blood patches and uh, uh, I am at the moment I am following up a patient who 
have done a epidural blood patch uh, still uh, when was it happened i t- sorry just Anusha, I'm here outside. Surprise. Uh, no, come inside the door. Sorry. You're not audible, Dr. Tamil. Unmute yourself. Uh, uh, so even now, that patient is undergoing, having a headache. And I have, and that patient had abdusan nerve, uh, nerve palsy. Um, In- and I had... You have six nerve, sixth cranial nerve palsy, diplopia as well, she developed. Uh, and then I have one patient who had hearing loss, which never improved. So I have seen all those complications, which I, which we read in the books. So in such cases, would you have gone ahead uh, with a uh, imaging? Because uh, that would be the... We, we, do, we do MRI, we do MRI. This patient, the patient which I am telling, had already three, four MRIs. Yes. Yeah. But but I'm I'm talking about where the resources are unlimited. You know, you need to think about that because in India the resources are very limited, so you can't keep doing imaging. No, we have uh, the situation where we have all the resources in most of the places and it's a private practice oh, good. as opposed good. to having a government good. hospital. They still would get referred to a higher center. But it is about uh, what is right and appropriate for that particular patient and if we are suspecting anything more than PDPH. Um, so if we have clearly ruled out it is a PDPH, if there was any nerve palsy, I think for the purpose of juniors who are listening and out there, young practitioners who haven't had as much experience as you would have had in a tertiary center. If there was any nerve palsy, if there was uh, diplopia, if there was a vocal cord palsy, which has also recently been quite often reported, yes. I would say whether it is a new batch of bupivacaine because we recently had one in a very, very normally placed spinal anesthetic, uh, which uh, persisted for 48 hours and then uh, uh, she recovered, but it was quite a difficult time to reassure the patient. So we had to go through uh, this cancer. If, if you had a patient with vocal cord palsy, I mean, how do you, with hoarseness of voice, how would you uh, go about Poonam or uh, Tamil? Uh, I have never had one um, touch wood. Um, hopefully, that, that's probably very rare, isn't it? Extremely rare yeah. complication. <laughs> Extremely rare. Her imaging was normal. Uh, she okay. presented. Yes, Guru, do you want to add something? Uh, no, no, no. You finish this and then I'll ask. So, uh, so com- in completion, so if we had somebody with any nerve palsy, with any neurological deficit, then it seems prudent to just ensure that the imaging is okay before we go ahead with 24, 48 hours of conservative treatment. If I think that was what we would do with a multimodal analgesic. And depending upon the tolerance level, as well as how understanding the patient and the anesthetist, the rapport is, I think we would go ahead with the rest of the management set. Personally, I have seen one patch while I was training in Liverpool, and I have given one here, which was an accidental dural puncture in a 35 kilo uh, patient. She was very slim, and uh, it so happened that she had, and but... I told her that within 24 hours, if her pain didn't subside and if she wanted to get discharged, we'll go ahead. So I did it at 48 hours and she it, she recovered well. Um, but if I, uh, the kind of patients we see in private practice and in the urban area uh, or even in the rural, I think they get very anxious when they have a persistent headache. So I think we have used a lot of uh, sphenopalatine ganglion blocks and people do see this is, this is though arbitrary. Yeah. I don't have data or audit, but Shiv had, the study and quite few of her friends on the Facebook group uh, right. have. Okay. Yeah. I believe is SPG block uh, should not be given as the sole modality. You combine it with other drugs and probably then they work better. So we have given uh, yeah, no, many a times, but it is always in combination with the cafe or with hydrocortisone. And then the patient got relieved of the headache is what our observation in the Institute is. And also yes. I've used the reversal agent once and surprisingly that patient had total amnesia of the incidents when I came and I gave her the reversal agent and I, went, I again came back to ask her about the headache 
she did not have any headache but she also had amnesia of the total event that i came to her i gave her drug and i don't know i just kept wondering why that should happen so that is one incident but i am happy that the patient got relief that is what ultimately mattered so that was quite quite such i'm i'm really waiting i'm really waiting for that study the new stigma and atropine yes, yes. that have might been uh, help but that, this is a meta analysis that they are doing now yeah yeah that might that might help us quite a lot yeah so can i ask do we have time yes you yes please try. yeah i would like to ask as an occasional obstetric anesthetic right occasional is probably uh, in now in my current practice is like once or twice a month my encounter is so my previous experience have been worked in uh, an obstetric hospital and all those things but now i become so occasional now when uh, the question is for these occasional obstetric anesthetists you know who end up doing either a c section or a labor and things like that if they encounter pdph in uh, fairly resource limited situations or even in a resourceful situation would you go conservative first with a lot less invasive procedures then going back to epidural blood patch which i think may be the gold standard but i think in terms of invasiveness it stands on the top okay you know so if i have to look at risk benefit uh, ratio and my personal experience with one occipital nerve block uh, after lumbar puncture has been fantastic so i even proposed to the department that you know you should look at this as a primary uh, treatment choice because it is lot less invasive it's quick to do easy to do you can do it in the ward uh, and patient do get good relief and we know that like more than 90% i don't know the exact number so uh, experts can come in that more than 90% of the post dural puncture headache eventually disappear almost 100% will eventually disappear so when that is the case and if you can just buy time for one or two days or three days with a lot less invasive procedure why not adopt that practice as a primary choice um so when i did this um uh, it was again through the experience from the facebook group when somebody had written about it i looked up on the youtube on how to do the occipital nerve block did it a blind technique uh, which uh, punam showed on the side where i just went down i didn't go right at the uh, base of the thing i just went down a little bit and my opinion at that time is also that often these patients have got this neck spasm the muscles in the neck do get into spasm and when you do this it's like a trigger point injection too and it did wonders you know to be honest such a simple intervention if it can do such a huge benefit then you just buy time out why not epidural blood patch is not a simple procedure you know there's so much of asepsis to be considered still there is a risk of another dural puncture risk of meningitis risk of nerve root compression compared to those risk you know why not there is uh, not much adoption of these two techniques the dual combined block that she went um, uh, what's his name i forgot uh, sunil 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 sunil, sunil malik from uh, delhi mm. yeah they together published and i met sunil at uh, uh, extra conference in glasgow or dublin uh, at dublin mm. i think uh, dublin, dublin and he he presented this and his uh, uh, you know it was a poster and he was selected to present to the audience and um, and i think it's uh, impressive very less invasive and to be honest a lot of headaches of my friends and colleagues have have cured with simple nasal sprays of local anesthetic yeah so many people with migraine frontal night i just tell them okay take this spray in your nose yeah. and it worked magic you know, i just you know i just can't believe how well it works to be honest that is exactly uh, how we work in private practice so uh, guru i think thanks for putting it absolutely straight because people do not want another invasive procedure they get more anxious and uh, apprehensive about it and considering it's a self resolving condition i think going with conservative measure nasal sprays we use them in headache clinics as well so uh, i think we've been increasingly using for tension headaches and uh, for spasm headaches and 
uh, pathophysiology of PDPH does say that it is 60 to 70 percent more of spasmic headache as it is not related to the actual leak because it's very unusual for any particular CSF leak to actually cause drop in ICP and actually cause a headache. I think that is the Monroe Kelly doctrine is far-fetched for the kind of 26 and 27 gauge needles that we actually use as opposed to the 22 we were using decades ago. So it makes total sense to go for conservative and use epidural bed patch as our uh, last resort if the patient, even after discharge or comes back at five to seven days and still we think that we have to offer something to her, then we can weigh the risk benefit. I think that's how I would uh, think of it. Yes. This was about six years ago. Um, and I gave this information to an obstetric anesthetist who works in women's and children's hospital. And uh, within a week, I got a feedback of excellent results. So they had a patient who had two rounds of blood patch, which didn't work, occipital nerve block span. Yeah. You know, so it, uh, look, I might make it sound too magical, but that is my personal experience. Sure. Shiv wants to yes, please, Shiv, yes. Uh, question to Poonam. For how long can PDPH not last can present? Then yeah. lost. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it, it presents immediately or can it present late? And if it can present late, how late can it present? There have been reports where PDPH was diagnosed when the patient presented with PDPH after even seven days. Although the definition says that after 24 to 48 hours is the maximum time that a PDPH would present. But there are reports where even after seven days of the dural puncture, patient has had a PDPH, diagnosed PDPH. So that can happen. Although the maximum domain is 24 to 48 hours. And uh, just, yeah. Will teacher say, can you present a year later? A year later also. <laughs> that is not in the I actually, also. I actually didn't believe believe that, but I was actually asked to actually do a dural puncture, uh, sorry, uh, epidural blood patch for a patient uh, who presented in the obstetric unit almost after a year. And I said, why is it? They say, well, it can be. And it did actually work. So uh, it is still, uh, right. you know, considered. <clears throat> there was a question on how it is done. Now you need to actually... There are risk factors. It's a very invasive procedure. You need to have two people. It's not that you can just have, you have one person who is actually have to take the blood aseptically as someone who is then ready to actually do the epidural also aseptically. And you have to be very than two. They still, I'm, I'm sure they still follow that one 20 ml goes into two bottles of the uh, aerobic and anaerobic uh, cultures and uh, 20 ml is actually given epidurally. Uh, thing is that this is just because oh, if there is a systemic infection that you know that it could have caused meningitis. The other thing is, is, the, is uh, I think a lot of these cases might be just be cases of uh, aseptic meningitis. And it's very difficult to actually prove those. So headache actually happening from the aseptic meningitis uh, where, well, like Guru said, oh, you actually get spasm of the muscle. That is a common presentation of meningitis. And in, the, in those cases, your uh, grid hospital nerve block is going to work. Okay. So I think sometimes we do not know what is actually causing the headache. And that's why, I, okay, you try different things. And then if it is not working, you move on to uh, something, something different. Uh, but I think the incidence of, I think, blood bags, even though Tamil is saying that that is something which uh, is still done in his unit and Things like that. I think people are still, because of the other things which are available <clears throat> and uh, better understanding, I think blood patch has become, even though it's considered as a gold standard, uh, people try to actually avoid it as much as they can because they know it, that there is actually associated risk of it. So when and things are about new stigma, I, I actually wrote about new stigma a long time ago on our Facebook group. And a lot of people actually have given uh, feedback and actually said that yes, it has worked. Uh, so it's it's it is something oh which is people are used to. So there and then again, spinopelad and ganglion block and uh, you know great hospital nerve block. We've been talking about this on the group for a very long time. It's not uh, you know just yesterday or things like. There is a quite a lot of knowledge which is there on the group which we have actually talked about 
uh, which now people are trying to actually now do meta analysis and things and prove it. And I'm, you know, all these things, there's never, never a single answer to, there's no, you know, single Stop. bullet for anything. Sir, I remember Guru Sir's case presentation on our group regarding Geo and Block uh, six yeah. years back. That time there was a comment by you that probably when we make the patient prone for giving the block, that patient has immediate relief because of the positioning for the block. And then of yeah. course the block works, but that positioning yeah. itself yeah. causes instant yeah. relief. Yeah, absolutely. I think and then then you're also relieving the muscle yeah. spasm. I think muscle spasm is a is is a common thing which happens in these kind of patients. Maybe that was the rationale why the ESP block also works. So in desperate measures, probably they must have given the block because they could not give an EBP, which could have been a definitive treatment. And that is how it worked for their patients. So maybe in desperate uh, situations, one may try out other measures if they want to avoid EBP altogether, probably. I, I would have actually gone much higher higher up. Rather, T4 actually sounds to, to me, it's, I think it's just coincidental. Uh, the, the, reason why, right, the reason why I'm saying that is because if you actually are even injecting 20 mls or you inject 30 mls, the spread cranially is no more than two to three segments. So you would have actually reached maybe T1. Okay, then if you're saying that, okay, it is blocking the uh, cervical, cervical thoracic ganglia, which is actually a sympathetic ganglia. Oh yes, it has got some connections. But I think reaching that level, I think it is, might be a little far, right? I might still be wrong, but... Uh, you know, the spread is, I don't know how much spread actually occurs uh, uh, with uh, T4. So if I wanted to use the erector spinal block, I would actually done a cervical level. I mean, the uh, lot of lot of my, uh, when we talk about the uh, deep cervical plexus block, where we actually give near the transverse process, they are basically uh, just uh, cervical uh, erector spinal blocks. They're not specifically going to the root. They're just hitting the transverse process and giving it there. It's, it's like giving a you know, to cervical spread. So I would go higher if I have to do that. See, all of these techniques apply to non-obstetric situations as well. A lot of these uh, young lads coming for daycare procedures, urology, orthopedics. I think uh, that's where if, I think they are more, they're mobile the next day. They want to go back to work. I think if they do come back with headache, I think th these are situations that I have encountered and uh, the nasal spray and occipital nerve block have helped. Uh, a big time. So it's more reassuring for the patients to know that it's not something to worry about. Absolutely. Even now, there, are few, few questions. there are a few questions on the uh, YouTube. Um, uh, what dose of Vesograin um, and what brand name in our country? I, I don't know which country this lucky girl Vesograin is. Vesograin is the, the name of the tablet itself. Vesograin is the name of the cocktail tablet. Yeah, cocktail okay. tablet. Yeah. yeah. So that is uh, uh, erector spinae uh, block. Yes, obviously it has to be has to be bilateral. Uh, it says whether it's going to be bilateral. You can't do just unilateral. And so in the SPG drug, block, I would add after COVID, really the resistance of the people to taking the SPG block has been very low. People easily agree now, as against in the pre-COVID, you had to actually tell them that we would be putting a swab into your nostril. Like, yeah. Now they are easy to go. Like okay, it is just similar to swab, so yeah. we are okay with it. Yeah, I'm just and, going to uh, take a swab. And Shiva, another thing is, you know the greater occipital nerve block, do they do bilateral yeah. as well? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Bilateral. Blocks are always done bilateral. Even the and NAG what block, about, what there about there the spinopalatine spino ganglion block? Both both bilateral. Like both bilateral, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So the, you're going to do four blocks. Uh, obviously, yeah. the uh, spinopalatine ganglion block is easy. Just a nasal applicator can be used for that or spray can be used. Uh, for that uh, that is very good actually because of the covid the yeah. acceptance is really good yeah absolutely like you're saying that you're just taking a swab um, any, yeah. has any experience using aminophilin in the wards any monitoring tachycardia i, I, would, uh, I, I think that that drug should not be used a very yeah. narrow therapeutic index uh aminophilin i think uh, shouldn't be used. It's it's gone out of practice completely. It used to be used so commonly, even in the intensive care. It's all gone because for respiratory reasons, we don't use it. So yeah. uh, I, yeah. I I have lost touch with it actually. So I was a bit yeah. uh, worried to use it. Although we have these caffeine tablets, I think they are yeah. widely obstetric. So yeah, caffeine caffeine tablets is used. They um, come in com combination with paracetamol and caffeine, so they are readily yeah. available tablets. Which also Absolutely. have Dolonex. Yeah. Um, 
do the drug concentration, any difference in drug xylocaine 5% Xylocaine 5% Bibican isobaric segmental span. I don't know what exactly the question is. Uh, I think they might be talking about does the kind of local anesthetic we use intrathecally make any difference uh, to the incidence of uh, PDPH? It's got, I don't think it's got anything to do with the drug. Not uh, to the drug. I think it's solely yeah. the technique multiple technique attempts is, yeah. and larger the needle. I think these are the only three things that have proven multiple attempts and the wrong technique. Uh, uh, time period in which PDPH settles down. I say, is, is, this is for Pnil. I, I came across a patient complaining PDPH in post of day eight. And that we have already just discussed that it can present pretty late as well. Uh, they do present. I think we have to rule out other neurological issues. Uh, PIH, postpartum yeah, yeah, hypertension. Yeah. Uh, make sure pay, no neurological deficit. Pu your complete neuro examination is done. And then once you've decided it's PDPH, then yes, we will treat it as per our protocol. And again, um, I know this is not related to a dural puncture, but I have actually <clears throat> had a patient, uh, a young patient who started complaining of, of uh, a normal delivery, uh, started complaining of, uh, you know, headache, a young patient and, uh, you know, we took the patient uh, for a scan and uh, initially there was nothing. Uh, patient was uh, put on observation. And this was during the daytime it happened. And then around midnight, I got a call patient and, you know, almost, uh, you know, stopped breathing. And we took and he had a, had a huge, massive intracranial bleed. Yeah. So these things, so we have to actually keep in mind that headache in young patients, you know, we have to make sure they are properly investigated before we actually, you know, say, okay, I'm going to give a, a dural uh, puncture, another <laughs> dural puncture, give epidural. You can cause another dural puncture and cause more damage. So, uh, you because know, they may have well so had undiagnosed aneurysms, dual yeah. puncture. We had a patient uh, who had spinal and uh, uneventful spinal. Twenty-four yeah. hours later, had a subdural. Uh, persistent headache, we had to do the scan and she had the subdural that was, uh, uh, and it, these things, I mean, recently had a, we lost a friend on uh, invocation of medical students. Mm. She actually collapsed while inviting the medical students as a dean of the college uh, due to bleed. Mm. And this was an unknown, undiagnosed aneurysm. So we don't know which Absolutely. ones the headaches are always uh, scared. So especially in young, young mothers and all, I think these are precious lives and I think uh, we need to actually you know, just don't take it lightly when a headache patient present with headache. Uh, don't just think that this is because of your intervention. It could be uh, unrelated to that. Uh, Tajinder actually has got a thing. He says, seen a case of press after a subacronal block with neurological deficit. Sadly, patient did not recover. Patient had similar problem in previous anesthesia from which patient recovered, which was not informed in the pre-op assessment. That's, that is really sad. Uh, again, I don't know who this lucky girl is, but <laughs> is it LA spray? Is, is it 4% topical spray or what does sir and madam? Okay. Oh, is uh, that her name? Lucky girl is her name? <laughs> yeah, it says lucky girl. I think okay. it's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's got lots of uh, questions. Okay. Any role of abdominal binders? Of course, car is something. I don't know. Yeah, what's your opinion about uh, abdominal binders and about uh, the uh, topical spray, 4%. Now, 4% uh, can be used. Uh, there are actually 10% spray, the 4% spray. Uh, obviously, don't actually use each spray, can actually afford the exact dose for each spray or used to be. Uh, but be careful. Don't oh, be over jealous with the, uh, the number of sprays, especially if you're using 10%. Absorption can be very high from the area where you are actually, uh, you know, spraying. So nasal spray uh, absorption is, is very, very high. Abdominal binders, did you talk about them? The conservative management does include abdominal binders, but again, uh, not really effective. Although in postpartum, some patients do use abdominal binders to have a control on the girth, but okay. uh, not really, uh, the evidence is not promising for PDPH prevention either. So no role. Yes. Yeah, no. somebody is after, after segmental spinal is Dr. Rashmin Sangui. 
how much incidence is segmental spinal anesthesia? I don't think we use segmental spinal anesthesia for obstetrics. I have not used it. I, think, uh, I, mean, I don't think there is any indication for using segment. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what segment you are using. You are using if you are breaching dura, there is always the yeah. chance of PDPH. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just loving those names. This one is called that oxymoron. <laughs> Anyone tried withdrawing into a needle <laughs> right after piercing the subcutaneous tissue? I don't understand what he's trying to say that. Um, but I think this is talking about uh, one of the techniques which has been described to uh, stop persistent uh, leakage of CSF. Is that we say that once you have done a dural puncture and we inject in the local anesthetic, there are two Again, things you can do. Yeah. You introduce or you do not disconnect your syringe, maintain that pressure and actually bring out. We get to said that dura, you know, we used to think that dural fibers are you know, running longitudinally and, you know, they're cutting it, it does that. But they, if you've seen the microscopic, uh, electron microscopic, they are all, you know, here and there. And then you can actually draw up some of these fibers and they then act like a wick. Okay. And then the CSF leaking through. That's one of the theories that we can have persistent uh, leak uh, with that. Uh, but I think it's, it's a good technique to not actually we will just leave your syringe attached to the after we inject maintain it and then then put it out or if you want to put your stillet you may hand. reintroduce the stillet but what is recommended yeah. is you do not disconnect the syringe at least that is the yeah. that is the easiest thing to do, do. Yeah. yeah everybody can do that yes yes <clears throat> and Navin Gupta does position of bevel of at the time of dual puncture reduces chance of PDPH this uh I can answer this one because I had actually written quite a lot about uh, this. And uh, this is only possible when you use a quinky needle. Okay, it does not hold good for pencil point needles or bullet point needles. Uh, this is only when you are actually using a quinky needle. Then you point the bevel towards the skin, not away from the skin, towards the skin. So it is opposite. It's normal tendency to point the bevel upwards. So you point it towards that. And it creates a flap which closes with pressure from inside. So the flap, the way the flap is created, okay, it actually just closes the, that's the theory behind uh, the use of <clears throat> the bevel. And again, going at an angle actually makes a lot of difference. The way you actually introduce the needle as well uh, also makes makes a difference. Does, it, does anyone use quinky needle nowadays? Uh, yes, because the smaller needles, 29G, and these are quinky needles. They can't be pencil point needles because they break easily. The smaller the needle, uh, size of the needle, they, see the UK is not using, I think, uh, finer needles. They they are happy using 25, 24, 25. Yeah, 25, cases, 26. Because it has not been shown that they're smaller. They, you know, there was the papers which describe where they use something like 32G needle and still found incidence of things. So well, the, that you're using a finer needle will likely reduce the, the thing is of, the, yeah. the thing is, um, there is no statistical significant difference in the incidence of PDPH above 27 gauge. Yeah. That's what I that's what I read. Yeah. Standard is 27 if the space yeah. is appropriate yeah. and 26 if uh, 25 or 26 uh, if the OB is an extra yeah. Yeah. So otherwise they just bend and we don't know whether they're going to break inside. exactly. If you have the you fear that the tip might break somewhere inside because the space is just totally. Yeah. Totally. They have all sorts of calcified kyphosis and scoliosis with the way the women are made up now. So, um, but I think pregnancy, yeah. that's one of the advantages. The effect of the progesterone makes everything yeah. like, feel like butter. So yeah, that's why you actually uh, get so smooth at lean women. I think that's the advantage of progesterone levels at that, that time uh, of the pregnancy. So that's good. Uh, but was it a uh, few people actually have. There is, is Nilu who has actually said very nice presentation, Poonam. Um, and I think Rashmi as well also says that. Um, Nilu has actually also made a comment. I think this will be the last one. Uh, we had a case who presented like PDPH but not responding. Later, she developed some neurological sign, MR revealed cerebral venous uh, sinus thrombosis, and she thrombosis. responded. Yeah. And we have published this as a case report. That's yeah. what we've been saying that please don't ignore other things. Do investigate the patient. Uh, huh? 
So uh, fantastic! I think there's been a great discussion, great presentation. Um, we want to move uh, on. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, I think let's go on. Yeah. Coming up to the next oh, talk. Yeah, yeah next okay. talk. We now invite uh, Dr. Tamil Selvan. Uh, welcome to our obstetrics symposium. Thanks for joining us uh, for the first time. We hope you can will join us more uh, in the future. Oh, definitely. He's anesthetist uh, in the UK. He's a medical examiner, college tutor. He works at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Uh, he does have a very special interest in obstetric anesthesia and has done a bit of research as well uh, and a lot into medical education. Um, we welcome him to give us a talk on maternal mobility and mortality lessons from the UK report. Thank you. Uh, Steve, can I have the presentation please? I will try to share the screen for you. Yeah. What's happening? Why is it not sharing the screen? Give me a second. Is that the embrace? Yeah, it is there. It is the, the, the I've opened, opened the thing. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm, I, I think, uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to yeah. give this lecture. Embrace, I think uh, everybody knows it's mothers and babies reducing risk by uh, confidential inquiry into maternal deaths. It includes, this is one of the longest running audit in probably I can say in the world history. It's uh, running since 1950s. And uh, next slide, please. So you can see uh, each report is published every three years. And uh, each report uh, takes one theme and uh, gives some uh, advice about that particular theme. So next one, please. I'm going to give some idea about how the uh, how this audit is done. Um, so every every three years, all the maternal deaths in all four uh, countries of UK and Ireland has been uh, audited. Next slide, please. Uh, Shu. So next, I, I'm going to tell something about the methods. So this is what happens. All the deaths from uh, Scotland, Wales, and uh, reported to the embrace. Uh, previously, it used to be confidential inquiry into maternal and child health. Uh, and then now it is changed to uh, embrace. And also we get all the reports from coroners and media and also all the other related conditions and uh, from the birth registration data as well. Next slide, please. So initially the deaths are um, analyzed and uh, it, uh, it uh, analyzed by a panel, which consists of midwives, obstetricians, anesthetists, and other specialities, which includes intensive care physicians, neurologists, uh, hematologists, depending upon which specialty it is involved. Uh, and they go through a rigorous uh, method of going through the whole care the patient received throughout their pregnancy and then uh, conclude what is the cause of death and uh, what lessons can be learned from this and then they produce the whole report. The next one please. So as I said you can see these are all the assessors uh, so you can see varied uh, specialities including uh, renal physicians and general practitioners which is not a common thing, thing in uh, uh, in India because people go to uh, specialists directly. And also it involves, involves psychiatrists and uh, pathologists as well. Next slide, please. 
So uh, we all know, whoever practice anesthesia, we all know how the maternal deaths are defined. So there are four definitions. One is direct, which is as a direct consequence of pregnancy, which is, for example, hemorrhage, preeclampsia, genital tract sepsis. Other sepsis are con comes in the indirect deaths and suicide. Uh, and indirect deaths are from the previous existing disease or disease that developed during pregnancy, which are not due directly due to obstetric cause, but aggravated by pregnancy, like cardiac disease and other causes of sepsis, like pneumonia, uh, renal urinary tract infection, um, and other causes of sepsis. Um, and um, coincidental, which is incidental or accidental uh, death occurs during pregnancy but not aggravated by pregnancy the prime example is road traffic accident late deaths late deaths are uh, the deaths which occur after 42 days but within the first year of uh, pregnancy ending so the direct deaths and indirect deaths are the most common which we analyze most of the times and uh, the for uh, the Results are presented like this every three years. Uh, the core reports, and uh, fun, uh, we all can access through the internet. And uh, I used uh, most of the slides from the uh, report itself. And uh, it is comp compiled by the uh, NICE and the RCUOG. NICE is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which provides all the guidelines to the doctors and RCOG, we all know Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, which they are providing the reports. Next one, please. So if you see the report, I'm, I've just done the last decade. So if you look at the 2024 report, which concentrated on the sepsis and the morbidity, because that time sepsis was one of the major cause of death. And in 2015, it was due, it was uh, thrombosis and malignancy and psychiatric. And then 2016 was cardiac. And 2017 is from uncontrolled epilepsy and psychiatric. Um, 2018 was severe hemorrhage. And I assume, I assume in India, hemorrhage is still the most common cause of uh, maternal mortality. And 2019, it's uh, uh, newly diagnosed breast cancer which is very unusual, but that is one of the common causes in that uh, year. And then pulmonary embolism, obviously morbidity. And then, uh, as we all know, uh, as the medical uh, science advances, the people having children, having the age of the mothers is also advancing. So this last year or the year before was care of the elder mothers. And last year was mainly due to uh, suicide and psychiatric disease. Next one, please. Uh, the next one. So you, as you can see, um, this graph shows clearly the top line shows the direct deaths. Uh, in UK, um, I'm talking about the last 20 years, it's almost uh, nearly stagnant. It started around 13, 14. Now it's around 10.9. Uh, which is both direct and indirect deaths. And uh, the direct deaths are um, and, and you can see in the last report, they have removed the COVID deaths due to pregnancy. And the bottom one is the indirect deaths, uh, which is again uh, saying, but now the indirect deaths are becoming more common than the direct deaths. The next slide, please. So you can see the, uh, unfortunately, the last report. Uh, that is why the, the suicide was as the major theme of the last last year because the most common death is psychiatric uh, followed by cardiac and COVID-19 and uh, the direct death if you look at the direct death is uh, first common presentation is thromboembolism in UK whereas in India it is apparently hemorrhage and the indirect death uh, is in UK it's cardiac disease I, I assume in India it's also it's cardiac disease now and um, as we are all anesthetists, you can look, we can be very proud of it. Uh, in the last nearly 10 years, anesthesia related deaths, anesthesia direct uh, death from an anesthetic event is only one per triennium, which we can be very proud of that. Next one, please. So you can see here the thromboembolism is the most common cause of death and sepsis 
uh, we have a very um, a rigorous sepsis protocol in every hospital, including hand washing and appropriate use of antibiotics, which led to massive reduction in the sepsis related deaths. Uh, COVID cost around 0.39, which is obvious, uh, but it is come. But obviously now COVID is completely gone, so hopefully we won't see many more deaths from COVID. The next one. So indirect deaths, cardiac disease remain the leading cause. The most com the common the reason for this cardiac disease is one is increasing age of the mother, and the second is we are very good at treating congenital heart disease. Uh, and they are all coming now and coming to the uh, childbearing age group. And uh, the, obviously, that puts a lot of pressure on the cardiovascular uh, uh, physiology, which causes stress. I assume in India, it's slightly different. It's a rheumatoid rheumatic fever, which causes rheumatoid heart disease, uh, which I know when I was practicing in India, I see so many mitral stenosis, which is very rare here. But unfortunately, um, apparently, that is... That is the most common reason in India, but I am I am hearing um, I am reading in India also the age of the mother is becoming more and more um, higher uh, due to uh, IVF. So that's another problem. And then neurological condition is the uh, second most uh, frequent cause of indirect death. But again, it is slight decrease. They are all non-significant uh, uh, decrease between the triennials. Next one, please. So the last report, which was published, uh, which covers from 2018 to 2020, we had 229 women died during the first six, uh, six weeks, which is 10.9. Apparently, in India, it is slightly variable. Uh, probably it's around uh, 73. That's what I read uh, latest. Uh, but apparently, the southern states are doing a lot better than the northern states. And even within the states, the rural areas are slightly uh, backlogged from the uh, city areas. But obviously, I, I'm sure uh, we will catch up uh, quite soon. So nine women died from COVID. Uh, excluding that, it will be 10.5. And uh, the next slide, please. So further, 280 women died between uh, six weeks and um, the one year. So if you include that, then it will become 13.8. Uh, but you can look at that. The most women died in the postnatal period, which is uh, six weeks to 12 months. That's a 54%. Next one, please. So uh, if you look at, uh, I don't know, this This is more, not probably relevant to uh, India. I have not seen any reports whether um, any um, race plays anything in India. But here, uh, black women or Asian women have more um, uh, time more chances of dying uh, giving birth uh, the main reason why i put this slide is you can see deprived areas leading to more maternal death i assume this is one of the major reason in india as well the deprived socioeconomically backlogging people have the higher maternal mortality rate uh, that may be due to um, access to the health care which is probably one of the most common risk, most uh, important thing we need to improve. The next one, please. So in, in 2020, as a suicide is becoming a more and more common. Uh, it is it's three times more likely uh, in this report. Uh, I am not, I, don't, I think Vanilla may be the best person to tell about this in India, how it is doing. Uh, I think we'll ask that during the question yeah. time. The next slide, please. So the next one, for the first one I'm going to talk is thromboembolism. Uh, we all know this is the uh, most common direct cause of death. Uh, you can see it is, even though it is coming on the downtrend, it is still the most common death. It's coming around 1.5 to 2. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, around 32 women died in the postpartum. And the most common reason is uh, PE. And uh, the you can see the deaths are slightly increasing in the latest report. But maybe that is due to the next slide, please. That's the, the, the that's due to the most common uh, denominator is the BMI. So because the BMI is going up, we are seeing more pregnant women coming with uh, DVT and P. 
obviously we all know pregnancy is a procoagulant uh, state and if you add a uh, higher bmi that obviously increases the chance of dvt and p next slide please yes, so, sure. so you can see the bmi increasing next slide please so the the major recommendation from this report is anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin including the weight adjusted this is the most important thing because of the bmi increasing you need to you need to adjust the weight adjust the dose of the heparin with the uh, weight uh, and it has to be initiated without any delay because there are loads of patients there were delays in uh, starting this treatment that's led to death uh, and then systemic thrombolytic therapy is recommended for high risk pulmonary embolism we all know that um, apparently here some of the patients in this report did not get that okay next one please so we all know the level uh, the evidence for thrombolysis is uh, level 2a so which is a very good very good uh, uh, evidence so the 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 learning uh, point here is as soon as you have a index of suspicion uh, whether we get diagnosis is made or not possibly they are saying you have to start the thrombolysis as quickly as possible next one so th that is a key message uh, vte remains the leading cause Puerperium time that is after six weeks still remain one of the high problems and obesity uh, BMI of uh, forty is really very very important reason and uh, you need to uh, plan the induction and delivery uh, if the patient is on uh, low molecular weight heparin you have to plan the induction and delivery as such a, in such a way that the amount of time they are off low molecular weight heparin is very minimal that's very thick. and then you have to give prophylaxis for minimum of 6 weeks uh, and always think of vte if you have groin pain fever or headache and manage the high risk pe as for the non pregnant and consider thrombolysis as quickly as possible next one so the next one is a pregnancy induced hypertension uh, um, we have again uh, it is coming down but you can see it came down from 0.7 to 0.38 but in 2012 it went down to 0.02 and obviously again the main reason for this is the weight bmi <laughs> which is which is coming you can see everywhere it is coming uh, coming in and uh, unfortunately our uh, i am seeing i do high risk obstetric anesthetic clinic here if i see 100 patients in my clinic um, 40% of them are uh, obese so it's a massive epidemic is going around so we need to educate about that so obviously the reason for um, from the uh, pregnancy induced hypertension we all know it causes intracerebral hemorrhage pulmonary edema eclampsia and uh, hepatic rupture which was before but not anymore and then um, it, it we, we all know this um but all, all i wanted to remember is you have when you have a pregnancy induced hypertension you should have a high index of suspicion for intracranial hemorrhage next one please next slide um, so help syndrome again the same we need to we need to see we need to have a suspicion of help syndrome we all know what it is help syndrome is um hemolysis elevated uh, in liver enzymes and low platelets uh, and also when during pandemic it got bit confused because that is also causing a lot of problems with clotting so next slide please so the conclusion from the this chapter is um uh, women with risk factors should receive aspirin um which is very important and then uh, now i am seeing many patients with high bmi they are all receiving 150 mg of aspirin Uh, i would really um, like uh, i would really uh, have an as uh, would like to have an input on this from vanilla what happens in india because here i am seeing many patients coming with 150 mg of aspirin because of high bmi and even my marginally elevated blood pressure and they continue up to the age of um, 36 weeks of pregnant and then they stop it afterwards uh and then what in the report what they saw what they thought is many many times uh, they were not measuring the blood pressure properly and even though the blood pressure machine was showing higher 
they thought it may be erroneous reading or something like so that is very important we need to make sure that you should not normalize the blood pressure you should take it as face value and prolonged induction process causes uh, impact on these patients you obviously know if you are keep on in the labor ward and inducing them and their anxiety goes up and their blood pressure goes up and then uh, fluid overload we all know we need to have a very strict uh, uh, fluid uh, uh, in, intake output criteria in pregnancy induced to hypertension so that is apparently that that needs to be uh, reemphasized so uh, as i said uh, hypertension is I, i i am not going to see any, any it's not going to go down in my opinion mainly because of the socio economic uh and uh, bmi changes uh, we are going to see more and more people with pregnancy induced hypertension next slide please so the next one is cardiac disease and pregnancy um the you can see uh, how it increased uh, because of the two reasons which i already uh, elucidated one is the um, age um obesity and uh, pre- pregnancy induced hypertension and congenital heart disease treated patient coming to that age of uh, giving pregnancy nowadays that's the reason which is going up next slide please so you can see uh, cardiomyopathy which is the uh, in my opinion that's the most important cause and uh, i think we need to have a high index of suspicion to suspect cardiomyopathy even if the patient did not have any previous uh, cardiac disease that's the most important uh, take home message from this and uh, next slide please so the recommendations are that there are five new recommendations uh, one is uh, wheeze um, because apparently there are few patients in this report they presented with wheeze and they all thought that it might be asthma and obviously it was cardiac conditions like uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, ischemic heart disease causing cardiac failure which is causing the pulmonary edema and wheeze and apparently they missed that so that's that's the most uh, uh, i think it is a basic clinical medicine but obviously um, obstetricians are probably missed that so it was not uh, highlighted enough so that's the red flag um, signs presenting with breathless, breathlessness uh, sudden onset breathlessness orthopnea chest pain respiratory rate oxygen saturation all low please please consider cardiac conditions in uh, pregnant patients next one please the next recommendation is uh, if you have any one um, coming with uh, risk factor for uh, vte also consider cardiac problems as i said uh, the age factors are age bmi smoking and if they come with hemoptysis tachycardia and tachypnea consider ischemic heart disease along with vte Uh, just just do not consider only vte and thromboembolism also consider cardiac causes as well next one please uh, and uh, this is the new thing which is uh, being developed in uk it's a maternal medicine network service so i i i i'm seeing more and more obstetricians are doing some medical uh, graduation and they are looking after these patients uh specifically cardiac neuro and hematology these are the three uh, sub specialty area uh, already there are couple of maternal physicians i know we we get in touch with them if we see any of the patients with severe medical problems i am not quite sure how this is being um, uh, done in india i assume it will come there as well next slide please Uh, another one is brain uh, bnp i don't know how many people know about uh, this one natriuretic peptide measurement in pregnancy this is a new recommendation again it is because of uh, cardiac disease causing failure and this is one of the best uh, marker to uh, tell about f- cardiac failure so please take a note of it and uh, if you have any ca- high index of suspicion measure the bnp and that will give you some idea about cardiac function next slide please so the the last one is a regular monitoring of anticoagulation uh, because I, i think if they are on uh, low molecular weight heparin and uh, if they are changed to from warfarin to low molecular weight heparin uh, we need to really monitor their uh, clotting levels 
Next slide, please. So the COVID and maternal deaths, um, I'm sure um, we all underwent a very uh, difficult time. So we have uh, 630 women notified with COVID. Uh, I, out of them, 427 pregnant women was hospitalized. I'm sure it is a very less compared to India. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so you can see first wave, alpha variant and delta variant. So pregnant and postpartum women appear disproportionately severely affected compared to non-pregnant women. So that's very important. We all know that. Next slide, please. Uh, so here in, in UK, unfortunately, even in my hospital, we did not give much in way of any treatment. You can see we the maximum they got was steroids and thromboprophylaxis. We didn't give anything else like azithromycin, Regeneron, and all those things. Apparently, that is one of the criticism in this report. Next one, please. So we had one in three have pneumonia. One in eight was in the intensive care unit. Uh, one in three had a preterm birth, and one in five had neonatal uh, um, admission into things. Uh, as I said, apparently, they did not get anything apart from steroids and VTE prophylaxis in pregnant patients. Uh, the evidence of reluctant to use other evidence-based medical therapies in pregnancy because they were worried that uh, what will be the impact on the baby. Uh, so they did not give anything else. Um, but they all said vaccination is yeah, strongly protective against severe disease in the real world. So here in UK, they had a lot of vaccination in pregnant patients as well. So that decreased the things. So next one is, uh, I'm going to touch something about critical care uh, because uh, there are loads of uh, recommendations for critical care. Next one, please. So there was uh, a care of the 35 women. Uh, 35 women was examined, wide range of pathologists. Um, unfortunately, mental health was uh, really playing up in this report. So you can see uh, preeclampsia, neurological conditions, and thromboembolism, sepsis, obviously. Psychiatric was four, which was really high, and the cardiac disease were 11. As, I, as we all know, cardiac is the most uh, common presentation for ITU admission. Next slide, please. Next. Um, so, what, what uh, the, the one of the main uh, recommendations is maternal early warning scores. So, they are going to use, we, we, we use uh, uh, early warning score in other place, other uh, part of the hospital. But apparently in maternity, the scores are needs to be slightly modified to reflect the, uh, the physiological changes in the pregnancy. Apparently because of that, some of the units were not using early warning scoring system. So that's one of the major recommendations. Next slide, please. So they 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 given where to give the critical care for a pregnant woman. Obviously, you can give it in you can give it in uh, delivery shoot because I, I have a uh, couple of HTU beds available in my labor ward. Uh, but the problem is they are not very uh, comfortable using invasive lines and things like that. But they are very comfortable looking after mother and baby. So if, if you're in the critical care, they are very comfortable looking after organ failure, uh, invasive monitoring, but they are not very good with uh, pregnancy medication and uh, prescribing uh, and awareness of uh, maternal, maternal early warning scores. And obviously, baby and partner get ignored. Uh, you can do it in the ward, medical ward. Again, they are they they have problems looking after pregnant patients, but they are looking they are good at looking after medical patients. So it's a dilemma where to have them. But in my opinion, I if I if in, if if the patient needs level one or level two, which is HTU or ITU care, I don't worry about. Uh, I I I my least worry is about baby and parents. Uh, uh, the father. My, my my main care is to the mom and the mom has to get better to look after the child. So I, I can compromise for a few days of um, uh, child care in the, in the neo, neonatal unit, uh, but I want the mother to be in critical care if possible. Next one, please. So uh, ensure the early warning scores and, and uh, other thing they say is uh, the multidisciplinary team. Like imagine you have a cardiac patient or neurological patient or 
uh, hematological patient, involve the ITU in the antenatal period so that you can have a proper plan in place for them. Apparently, that is they have identified uh, in UK the multidisciplinary team planning is not happening as regularly as expected. Next one, please. So these are all the previous existing recommendations. Uh, acute illness, uh, severe acute illness, multidisciplinary teamwork. And then uh, the uh, we all know that uh, how to escalate to the ITU uh, people. So apparently there is always uh, lack of initiation and they left it too late before they um, called the ITU, especially in labor work. And as we said, pre-existing medical conditions should have pre-pregnancy counseling, uh, like, you know, people with cardiac disease. I, I recently saw a patient with severe pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary hypertension allowed to become pregnant, which is a disaster. So pre-pregnancy counseling is not happening. So that's, that led to a couple of deaths in this report. Next slide, please. So the general clinical assessment, obviously nutrition is very important. It needs to happen in uh, assess. And as I said, the pulmonary hypertension and uh, pulmonary stenosis patient, they would benefit from ECMO. So uh, we need to have uh, access to ECMO. Next one, please. So anesthesia, uh, we all know, as I said, uh, in the last 20 years, anesthesia, in the last 50 years, anesthesia made a massive progress. If you go to the next slide, please. So you can see in 1952, anesthesia related deaths were here. Now, in the last 20, 30 years, the anesthesia related deaths are very, very minimal. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to go through a few lessons uh, in the last few reports, like the last 10 years. Uh, PDPH, we had a, a very good discussion uh, in the previous lecture. So a uh, couple of years, couple of years ago, means a couple of reports ago, the PDPH was caused two or three deaths. So then they put they, get, they had a lot of recommendations on that. So proper follow-up, proper imaging, um, um, uh, timely intervention, and uh, proper follow-up in after they get discharged. Like uh, we had a question, how long after PDPH can present? How long after the uh, venous thrombosis can happen? So those kind of things can happen. And then another death was due to hypoventilation. Uh, the anesthetist was not uh, monitoring uh, carbon dioxide monitors at that time. And the another patient had a high spinal and uh, collapse. Uh, there was one um, anaphylaxis collapse and there was a patient with hyperkalemia which was probably on uh, acute renal failure and hyperkalemia was not treated so these are all the lessons uh, learned from the anesthetic point of view but as i said uh, what uh, and here now we are going more and more towards uh, difficult airway management and safe obstetric general anesthesia because uh, we we move, we do loads of uh, spinal and epidural 90 9% uh, of elective cesarean sections are done under spinal and around 90 to 97% of emergencies are done under spinal. So the training anesthetist, we are getting uh, new training. They do not have uh, exposure to general anesthesia. So now we have a, a new algorithm even for doing a safe general anesthesia for obstetrics. This is what we follow in our institute. Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, this one is a very important slide. Uh, when to uh, how to proceed uh, with the uh, fetal condition and maternal condition, and how the uh, depending upon the grade of the anesthetic and obesity and the surgical factors, so we can see where we are. Uh, I'll share this presentation with all you guys, so you don't need to worry about uh, looking at this slide. Next one, please. So this is the uh, failed tracheal intubation. This is from the Difficulty Airway Society. Again, I will share this presentation through Shiv. You can get all these slides. Thank you. Next one. Next one, Shiv. Uh, and then, as I said, the age of the woman is increasing. So you can see how much uh, uh, woman aged 40 is almost um, four times higher now. Uh, next slide, please. 
so you can you can see the number of live births given by human increasing age uh, obviously that put a lot of uh, uh, problem for us especially anesthetist so because of increasing comorbidities like pih uh, dvt obesity cardiac problems all those things uh, so we need to be more and more um, uh, work up these patients and have a probably identify them uh, well before uh, they come to delivery by doing echo or by doing uh, respiratory uh, assessment all those things next slide please so the, the they were reviewed this uh, in this chapter we reviewed we reviewed a woman who was uh, 45 and older around 37 was that uh, <laughs> this chapter was focused on maternal care with a clear message. Next one, please. So there were multi-paras, overweight or obese, uh, IVF, multiple pregnancy. 59%, uh, as I said, 59% of them have pre-existing medical problems. Imagine we, previously, you know, we, you never have any pre-existing medical problem. They're all very young and fit. But now this is what we are going to deal with. So, suicide um, in in UK, uh, suicide and pregnancy has a yeah, massive increase. Uh, so, if in this report you can see, it is three times more likely to die by suicide up to six weeks in pregnancy. So, you can see the relative risk is three point two two. So, it's I uh, I think it is probably uh, substance abuse and domestic violence and migration. All those things are causing this. Uh, next slide, please. So, 28 women died, and you can see this uh, comparatively, it's gone up quite a lot compared to in 2017 and 19, it was 2.6. Now it has come up to 3.84. Next one, please. So, this is what they're saying. Um, so, suicide is around 62 maternal mortalities. Uh, the second most common direct cause of women uh, deaths during uh, up to six weeks of pregnancy. Uh, it's very, uh, very difficult. Uh, I don't know. You can see it's suicide and substance abuse. This is massive, massive problem for us. Um, so obviously, uh, the psychiatric involvement and mental health and uh, probably the family and friends, they are the one can help in this situation. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, good communication, proper assessment, uh, and comprehensive specialist service provision. I don't know how uh, how good the psychiatric services, and I don't know how how big is this problem in India. But UK is a massive problem. We are taking major uh, major steps to uh, counteract this. Uh, now the social workers, the psychiatric, and even the midwives are uh, doing regular follow up of patients up to six to. Even though nowadays, I can see uh, midwives are following them up to three months uh, in the postpartum period to avoid this. Next one. So the uh, the classification of care, the overall report um, is good care received only twenty two percent, and improvements to the care which could have made difference is around forty percent. The improvements were so basically what I'm saying is. Roughly around 40% of the women who had died could have prevented if the care would have been better. So that is the that is a message. Next slide, please. So this is the this is the key uh, message from this report. So the maternal mortality rate is almost stable in UK, um, and uh, substantial inequality is causing the problems. The cardiac disease and mental health are the major cause uh, of main junk of the problems here. And uh, suicide among the teenagers is one uh, major problem here. And obviously, the inequality in the uh, socioeconomic status plays a major role as well. Next one. So this is the uh, what we need to do is we need to uh, have yeah, a team approach uh, continuing um, social care, continuing um, GP services and uh, good uh, preoperative assessment, multidisciplinary team approach, all those things will probably help to improve, keep improving the uh, care we give it to the pregnant woman.
thank you for listening to me any questions or uh, probably i'll give it to vanilla yes thank you thank you very much uh, dr tamil selvan for the extraordinary uh, presentation because i think it's quite extensive data i think to cover i could be here the entire evening and tomorrow okay. trying to discuss each one of those questions uh, you raised because there's a um, there's a lot of lessons to learn i think it's a very very interesting and uh, important audit that's been going on in the uk and i have learned a lot as a trainee from then and i still follow I, i'm fortunate enough to work in a hospital where we are able to follow the guidelines and use with the rcog and rcoa guidelines and actually develop a safe environment but not everyone that is, is uh, fortunate enough so uh, it's yeah. uh, when i say yes it's all the same i i i'm following it i'm speaking for myself as not uh, related to all my colleagues across the board it's very very variable india is very diverse and uh, we take a lot of points in but we have to adapt to our situation so i think we have to take one point at a time okay. i mean shiv would you like to intervene or shall i proceed that correct mm -hmm. oh you can you can yes so uh, i think that was uh, uh, absolutely uh, you know wonderful considering that anesthesia related deaths i think that's the one thing i think we need to be uh, very proud about and continue to provide service because Correct. i think uh, spinal has made a huge difference and not just spinal the preoperative and postoperative care um, yeah. the most important point the second point we would like to raise is the antenatal care we need to be involved in antenatal care high risk right. stratification has to be done and it needs to be picked up by the gps who's referring as well as our obstetrician and we need to be involved early on and i think this is one of the primary things i set up in my unit so that uh, we have people we know who this lady is who's going to come we follow them right. up and we have the multidisciplinary team involved a cardiologist pulmonologist cardiologist. If necessary nephro if necessary and the neonatologist just also counsels the mother early depending on what the baby is going to be so that is point number 2 from relation in points with us and on table once they come sick what do we do i think uh, that is what we were talking about you know the deaths related to postpartum hemorrhage uh, preeclampsia while it is primarily cardiac related there we still have postpartum hemorrhage as a major cause in india and in the developing part of the world and uh, second comes uh, hypertension kinds of diseases of pregnancy and cardiac causes and then comes mental health since the covid actually oh, it's been okay. highlighted in the mental uh, maternal morbidity data and uh, it's been a serious issue post covid this was not highlighted pre covid and uh, uh, there's a lot of work being done however i think we are still very primitive when it comes to it Uh, the society itself uh, however i think we are working on it uh, from what i can see at national as well as within the city urban as well as rural population they are trying to address this right from the antenatal clinic i think uh, that's one increasing age of the mother and cardiac obesity i think uh, it was well highlighted i think we have done multiple symposiums related to elderly mothers uh, ivf i think we in fact had a session last time yes. on based on ivf mothers being a high risk and why they are high risk and uh, coming to uh, obesity obesity is a stigma uh, i remember doing uh, this uh, 10 year audit in uh, liverpool women's which we presented with phil barkley and uh, i uh, published a paper Uh, we're twenty to nineteen ninety eight to two thousand eight. We had a rapid increase in morbidity where we had to introduce long needles. So when we had to, when the right. trainees started seeing that there was an increased need to use long needles and ask the patient to reposition themselves more than once, we started recognizing there was more of a problem, and we started looking at the retrospective data how much the obesity became a problem and why certain BMIs had to be, uh, you know, addressed early. So uh, now I think we have gone from ten percent to forty percent, as you suggested, and my center is purely high risk, so I only see obese and. cardiac so oh. <laughs> yes anything but uh, that is uh, important um lifestyle disease is the major major uh, reason as you pointed out we are working on the um dbt prophylaxis 
we had a symposium on cardiac mothers so i guess uh, i think with relation to cardiac we had a good discussion and the okay. recent data suggests that yes rheumatic heart disease is high up on the list about 50 to 55% of the women identified are rheumatic but we have Correct. a significant number with hypertensive disorders and myopathy as well picked myopathy, up myopathy cardiomyopathy uh, because of our lifestyle disease so we are doing antenatal check especially in tamil nadu or every antenatal mother gets uh, an echo on the government side. Side, and all the more there is a reason for us to do on the private side so it is a welcome investigation being done to pick up any cardiac problems um and with regards to ivf the recent government guidelines is that we had a maternal death more due to ivf in multiple gestation and uh, problems oh. due to four and three and four babies and having problems so now the age limit is only up to 50 so previously i used to see greater than 50 55 and that was a problem real problem dealing with them in the peripartum period but now less than 50 gives us a little solace because i think we are still able to uh, hydrate a little better um I, i just wanted to uh, uh in, in, in i mean have a little bit I mean accessibility i have four slides on indian mortality if i may can i share that one because yes, yeah. I, instead of me just talking i think it would be nice to yeah. Yeah. that'll be very useful uh, very yeah. useful So I just thought because it will be the direct. Uh, this is what we want to know uh, when we want to compare and what lessons Correct. to take uh, from what we see from the embrace, which is a great audit, and I think we are beginning to do uh, quite uh, decently well in India at the moment. So oh, this good. is uh, uh, something that was uh, got from the go document on, on the slideshow. Go on slideshow. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so this right. is about um, with the world this is from the WHO website it says postpartum hemorrhage is still the leading cause of maternal death worldwide and india is still among the uh, top countries that's having pph peripartum hemorrhage as a leading cause of maternal uh, mortality so we are still addressing uh, some of the basic things because uh, like you said it is about how soon they come to the hospital have they been prepared how do we know who the high risk mothers are do we have the skills to deal with them at the particular center and where do they go if there is a pph do they have a critical care you know do they have blood so we are still dealing with this basic problems and a lot of efforts have been taken across the country and improvement has happened since the 2017 government policy came in and in the last 5 years there's been a tremendous in, uh, improvement but we are uh, making progress and yet to make more progress so this was uh, published last year end of last year there's a huge decline in maternal mortality ratio since uh, 2015 uh, so and it's going further down uh, from 130 and since the policy came in because essentially what they did was more health workers being deported to periphery to phcs more doctors more anesthetists more obstetricians and the asha workers uh, in the north india and the midwifery has always been a part of in the southern india but it's also been implemented more in the northern india and mainly the financial support to these people because they need to be paid appropriately they were visiting their homes to actually reach out to these women and that is how they were picking up high risk mothers hypertensive mothers breathless mothers the key factor for a uh, patient to be referred one breathlessness on exertion is off and swelling of the feet are often uh, considered as part and parcel of pregnancy but however we need to have criteria along with the clinical signs and a clinical they need to be referred to a physician i e an anesthetist or a medical physician to know whether they have any cardiac problem or whether they have proteinuria so this was the first thing that was uh, changed and again when they come to hospital if they are unable to lie down i think this was one thing the who suggested if when the mother is unable to lie down flat or even up to 30 degrees you know there is a serious problem there and hence forth you put her in a hd or icu where you monitor the vital signs i think these are three things that were picked up from the 2020 who world audit and that's been implemented in india and that's what we teach our nurses midwives and our uh, trainees to see when the patient comes to ear so uh, this is the significant improvement i mean it's widely different across our states but each state is improving uh, so kerala is the best amongst the performance and i'll tell you why uh, they have the lowest mmr of 19 
uh, as opposed uh, to uh, uh, Maharashtra is next, 33, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, they all pretty much about the same, which less than 70% uh, maternal mortality rate was the sustainable goal, so, you know, put as a goal uh, for the next five years in the last WHO meeting for maternal health. So these were the states which achieved the sustainable goals. The rest of the states with slightly higher rates, but still they were doing better than the previous uh, two years. So we are still improving. Uh, Sam, this is obviously because of the higher population, wide difference between the financial status and accessibility to healthcare and how the infrastructure itself was in the states in the previous five years. So they have improved. The government policies have changed. And uh, I must say the doctors there and the patients there from what they say in our national OAA meetings is quite remarkable that they are meeting. Even recently, we had a national meeting to say that we the next year, week we have the OAA meeting where we have a policy about uh, PPH um, and more availability of drugs and doctors. Um, so significantly declined urban rural divide is decreasing. The sustainable goal has been achieved. The difference is due to various factors and we still need a lot more financial support because we are still uh, not uh, yet reached the support that we actually need for maternal health. So mainly it's the skilled healthcare workers, doctors in, of all the specialties who can primarily pick up problems, ANC, antenatal checkup, high-risk referrals, THC delivery and outreach teams. This is what is making the difference, you know, and access to higher center. If a primary health center can immediately call up someone and actually make a difference, ambulance, access to basic nutrition, they're actually bribing patients, actually have an incentive scheme to actually come in and take iron and uh, nutrition so that their mothers will actually be healthy. So there's an awareness program as well as cash incentive schemes to help the mothers to actually have healthy babies and take care of themselves. So there's a lot of schemes addressed, but we still have a long way to go. So despite everything, the UN study says that India is among the top countries uh, who, uh, making up 60% of global maternal death. Uh, stillborns and newborn deaths. So we still have uh, uh, some more work to do to make sure our mothers are safe. I think it's totally unacceptable if we have a preventable death happening, you know, that is uh, it, it, because of time lag or people lag or skills lag. I think we, that is where what we are addressing today. So this inquiry is what made a difference to Kerala and a lot of uh, teachings to people within the southern countries or even to India has been from Why Mother's Day document that come up from Kerala. So Dr. Paley is one of the senior obstetricians who returned to India from the UK sometime in 2004 and started doing this uh, because that's what he learned from uh, the UK. And uh, he's been uh, observing a state audit. He's part of the confidential he's the state coordinator for the confidential review of maternal deaths and they actually have stringent data collected and the care and they make sure that every near miss and uh, critical incident is actually detailed audit during a combined isa and oxy meeting where obstetricians and anesthetists sit together and think what could be different next time in a particular district in a particular area where and therefore they have created outreach teams so every PHC or every small maternal center has a, a regional center to call for help when they have trouble. So they have a liaison for ambulance. So in this way, they actually ensure that the uh, junior doctors in the periphery or a system do not feel left out or insecure or do not have the blame culture. So they, they have a connected system and that's made a significant uh, change. And this has been continuously audited from 2004 till now, and they've had a steady improvement. They have made some system changes as well as some equipment changes, and their training is based on drills, on a regular drills. I had the, the pleasure of visiting one of their meetings where they invited me about maternal collapse and RCOA guidelines. And uh, I was quite impressed that they, they were very much clued into how these things are done and uh, the obstetricians were willing to listen to anesthetists you know that was a welcome thing to uh, look forward to and he's uh, he's uh, i think the person that all the obstetricians to learn from so they in, uh, in for pph prevention they had some uh, new equipment iotic clam uterine clamps to reach out from below and the balloon clamps they are present in every maternal unit to prevent pph and how to actually shift an ambulance is a drill that they do for every one of them. So these are the preventions for PPH. 
and they've been devised locally and used and they are cheaper and uh, henceforth easily purchased by every obstetrician who has a small center and they are using them on a regular basis and he has an innumerable number of YouTube videos and he makes sure that the patients are actually kept safe. So this is a transvaginal uterine artery clamp, which was devised by Dr. Paley and uh, uh, the, he teaches them on a regular basis in his uh, courses. So preparations and drills, I think this is what uh, they were talking about, how to get uh, prepared. Uh, increased financial support, I think we are still uh, looking for. From the patient side, more awareness, attend ANC clinic. I think from the poorer side, uh, from the underprivileged people, I think the problem is they don't actually take care of themselves. So we are still look, have a lot to on that side. But on the urban and the patients who actually come to private, they are well aware and uh, they do come in early. I think we are the people who have to divert them to the right places and we should have these joint clinics so patients are kept safe. So what can we do at our workplace? Have a local protocols, have organizational actions. Once a sick mother is there, this is for uh, PPH that we have. Uh, have preemptively have high uh, multidisciplinary teams, appropriate resuscitation, have protocols and uh, blood products immediately available. So these are things that we do in our place. Pregnancy related hypertensive disorders. I think this is a huge iceberg that's well kept under the surface in India. But the way we look at it is the atypical preeclampsias are becoming more common in my practice that I see. No proteinuria. They may not actually have a sky uh, rooftop uh, blood pressure, but it's more than 20 to 30 percent above your baseline because they are only 145 or 150 centimeter with no muscle mass and only some edema. In that case, the BP of 130, 85, 130, 90 is actually high and they have some headaches, some discomfort and breathlessness. Then we go on to do the uh, investigation. So we have some very interesting cases. Uh, uh, I think that's being presented in the state and national forum as well. But this is something that all anesthetists and obstetricians have to be aware of to pick up these uh, women when early on. Sacral edema, earliest sign to actually pick up before they actually become full-blown edema. So watch for the signs and treating BP alone gives false assurance. And uh, this is uh, what we have for our uh, patients. So I just stop with that. With regards to the data, I just wanted to con convey what our uh, national data is. And uh, Dr. Paley's Why Mothers Die audit has made a big difference. And I think Tamil Nadu is also doing this and we should be able to publish uh, something. So you know, we can learn from it, actually. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Manila, for that insight. I think uh, that makes sense after, directly Tamil's talk thank on, you. Uh, you know, what happens in UK and what is happening in uh, India. <clears throat> um, I think uh, about, about the age, increasing age, uh, BMI, uh, smoking probably... <laughs> It's common in the rural areas rather than in the urban. I'm uh, saying that uh, still maybe wrong because a lot of things are hidden. Uh, unlike in the uh, rural area, which is they don't, you know, it, it is, it is, it is uh, I think, a lot more common with women smoking. Um, but I think uh, age has become, I think uh, that is in India, I think a lot to do with, uh, I think, uh, assisted. IVF. Thing. Yeah. I think that's that's I think is very very common. There are a huge number of centers all across. It's a big business as well. Yes, absolutely. It's a big business as well. So you are going to see women who are in the age group of 40, 40 years and above uh, coming coming to uh, for delivery. Um, Invariably, the obese have a GDM uh, or yeah. diabetes, and then I think uh, so. Yeah. New neonatal morbidity mortality and uh, early premature labels are very very common and, and iud so i think uh, i'm seeing a lot of gdms and it's very scary to see the levels of sugar and insulin mm -hmm. and the babies coming out in different shapes and we don't know how these kids are going to be in the future absolutely how they are going to grow or what deficiencies they will have um, and things things like that and again i think uh, Infertility is a is lot more common in the, uh, I think obesity and infertility are, really, there may be obviously other causes for that, but you do see, see I think uh, women, that's what I've been told from the 
you know, people who do uh, over the travel uh, in India, our anesthetist friends, that they are seeing patients who are, uh, you know, morbidly obese. And yes. I don't know. Uh, so I think there are different challenges. I think at every decade, you have different challenges. Yes. And I think in our is going to be, uh, <clears throat> again, I think Tamil also alluded to this, that uh, the uh, patients who have congenital heart disease, uh, there has been a lot of improvement in the treatment of congenital heart disease, and these patients are coming to the childbearing age. And we're going to see that. So now we have in our hospitals, and then women's has got a, speci a specifically lead for the uh, congenital heart, adult congenital heart disease. So any patient who presents with them, they need to go through them. Uh, we have actually a lead for the whole of Liverpool as well. So uh, at heart and uh, you know, chest hospital, uh, there's someone you can consult with uh, when you get patients like this. So they are being looked into. Uh, again, I think, I don't know about India, whether we're seeing that kind of uh, population, uh, but rheumatic heart disease is still very common. Yes. I think the first is rheumatic, and I, as Guru presented last time, I think we've had we are yeah. having an increasing number of congenital heart disease corrected uh, patients mm -hmm. as well. And uh, I mean, they do do well, but it's just that how we titrate and yeah. uh, you know get them through. Oh, yeah. But the group of people on warfarin converted to heparin are mm. often uh, uh, you know very right. difficult to. Yeah. Uh, that is the one that I find often very challenging for the operative period and uh, having, you know, avoiding any hemorrhages, yeah. avoiding any problems um, is often difficult. And uh, you just feel like, oh, uh, you know, you just want that patient to go home fine. Um, we just haven't got it's, it. It's, one of, it's one of the deaths in, the, in this report. Uh, that is why they were very uh, careful um, how to convert from hep warfarin to heparin and then. In fact, we had one of the patients, we just kept her on heparin uh, for the first three months. And then the second trimester, the cardiologist said, put her back on warfarin because organogenesis oh, yeah. is poor. But it is uh, for her, you know, warfarin is the only one that's going to keep her valve okay. So we put her yeah. back on warfarin. Then again, uh, you know, we took her up early, 32 weeks, 33 weeks, gave us okay. steroids, stopped the warfarin, converted back to heparin and uh, did the case under uh, spinal. I mean, in those patients, I even though they are cardiac, I think I find the epidural may have. What do you? What is your opinion? Epidural has higher risk considering we're going to start a lot of uh, regulations. I find either a yes. GA or a single shot or spinal, or a load of shot spinal is better. on GA. So we don't know where we are venturing with the epidural needle, and what mm -hmm. might be the consequence once single they start single shot single shot spinal. Yeah. Um, I am I am I am more comfortable with single start spinal rather than epidural in these patients. It's me too. If I'm so, not happy with the spinal, then so I will hear the G S. Yes, yes. So, so that the, 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 the patient who had here double you are breaking down. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry. The the patient who had death here is was war on warfarin and uh, advised not to become pregnant but she became pregnant and uh, they were they were trying to change warfarin to low molecular weight heparin but because she had a metallic mitral wall she threw a embolus and became uh, developed a massive stroke and died mm. See, it's so disheartening to see me. And I think I've mentioned one of my patients before as well. She had SLE and uh, pulmonary hypertension and she was told not to have babies again. Okay. Yeah. She kept the reports quiet to the obstetrician. Yes. She didn't tell them. She got pregnant. She came at 37 weeks, 38 weeks, full term, breathless. And she never told me she has SLE. I had no idea why she had embolus and she died on us in the ER. Hmm. Because she just wanted the baby somehow. Oh. She didn't want to in relate to the society, her husband, her mother-in-law. You know, there is so many yeah, issues. Exactly. The things we problem. cannot prevent, but what we can prevent Stigma. is increase the awareness about these drugs and actually uh, tell. I mean, regarding the BNP, is it done uh, in ICU or you do them actually in the prenatal period? BNP for uh, biomarkers for pregnancy-induced hypertension? Uh, prenatal period. Prenatal. First time, if, if, right? Yeah. Uh, if any... If any no, no, I think probably in the uh, second trimester, when they become, if they become, if they come with edema or breathlessness or tachycardia, then mm. they do BNP. 
and oh. if the bnp is raised you know that uh, there is something going on they do a echo after that okay uh, fine this so is we, more to uh, rule out rule out uh, cardiomyopathy in uh, patients the yes. cause the cause yes. cause for breathlessness i think that's well, that the reason for it. In talking about the aspirin 150, we are following, I think, pretty much, I think even uh, Dr. Vidya had raised about this in uh, the last yes. uh, discussion, and we have been discussing this in the Facebook group as well. Yeah. A lot of patients are on aspirin 150. Uh, the yes. moment uh, they see, you know, bad, anybody with bad obstetric history, APLA right. syndrome, Correct. Anybody who has a reversal of flow identified in the first to second trimester, they increase it from 75 to 150 milligram to save the uh, baby. You know, at, le at least get the baby, baby. for yeah. 32 weeks. You know, you know that is the whole deal. And, yes. and in addition, they are on uh, clexane, inoxaparin. Uh, 0.6 or 0.8. I think yeah. the more we have to create awareness, uh, the, I think the more uh, aware they are, the obstetricians put them on 0.8. Otherwise, they still put 0 0.4, 0 0.6, suboptimal doses, and they're not really serving the purpose. So we are still worried because we are seeing 130. I think Puna might also be seeing 130, 140 kilo ladies easily with a height of 155, 160 centimeters. So they have a huge, uh, you know, risk for uh, DVT. It's not like they are tall and big. They're also, uh, you know, short and big. So uh, I think optimization of this uh, clexane and aspirin does help. And we still go ahead with regional as per the ASPRA guidelines, unless patient has any other reason not to do spinal. Isn't it, Dr. Tamat? Yeah, we still go ahead with spinal and uh, all these patients so uh, okay. that's that's how we do here as well so no no we 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 do we we don't want to, we stop yeah no some they all come in the middle of the night so we don't have an option but to go ahead with uh, on 150 milligram we still go ahead uh just single shot hopefully it should be okay uh i think that is the but we, we probably have to take an informed um, i'm i'm happy if they're if they are just on aspirin. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yes. Uh, we have, Guru wants to share uh, some, uh, the database uh, we have created. Uh, Guru, are you there? Uh, yes, Shiv. I just want to make sure uh, we don't have any questions from the audience. I just wanted uh, to finish this off. There, there isn't, there isn't any, any at all. No. Okay. Oh, um, thank you, Shiv. Uh, thank you, Vanilla. And, uh, Dr. Tamil Selvam, I just thought uh, since we are talking about you know data and statistics and uh, how valuable it is um, for us to learn lessons and basically from that lessons you know we can improve the safety and quality in our practice you know um, so one of the efforts that, that we have done with the Global Anesthetic Society is to develop databases um, which is a central database where you can log in all your uh, cases. Uh, uh, and uh, all the analytics is automated. So I just thought I will share um, with the audience quickly to show uh, how it is done and uh, so that it can be utilized uh, in the near future when we got um, large data and uh, we can have some meaningful uh, uh, discussions and uh, outcomes from that. So I'm just going to share the screen here. Okay, and you can see here, um, so you can always log in through medusis.in uh, slash login and uh, you'll enter your username and password. If you are a new user, you can create an account or you can go through the registration process, which I'll show a bit later on. Um, so when you log in, um, you will log into a screen uh, which shows like this. Um, now, when you log in for the first time, it will go through a couple of steps like this, you know. Uh, so if you're part of the Global Anesthetic Society, this is what it will come up as. And you can see there is this uh, uh, section on the left side where you can add patient. The reason it is outside of the databases is that uh, you can add one patient for multiple uh, sections. You know, it could be for labor. The same patient who was in labor could come for obstetric anesthesia. But uh, very soon we'll have this uh, duplicated elsewhere also. So it's very simple. So if you got doing a labor analgesia or, or an obstetric anesthesia, all you do is click and to add a new patient here. Now, mandatory fields are indicated with a star. You can see, and you can enter the age and weight. So the BMI 
um, uh, sorry, weight and height, and the BMI is automatically calculated, uh, which will be used in analytics to identify you know, patients with BMI because some of these factors influence the outcome, both obstetric outcome and fetal outcome. So all the data that is gathered are uh, basically which influence outcome. So once you enter these details, now patient email ID is not mandatory, but if you have a patient who is, who's got access to email, uh, this will be useful to obtain uh, patient-related experience measures, which I'll show in the end. Okay. Um, so once you've done that, your patient will show up here on the list. As you can see, this is a unique identifier number. The patient identifiable data is not shown, is all hidden. Once you've done that, you can go to clinical databases. And uh, I think here you can see PNB is still upcoming. We've done for CNB, labor and obstetrics. I'll quickly go through the labor analogies here. Now, here it will ask me to show, you know, choose a patient. So there is one patient on the list. If you don't know if there are multiple patients and if you're doing a follow-up and if you don't know, you can always click on this lock button uh, where you can enter your password again and the patient details will show up. So click on this patient. Again, you can see the name is hidden here uh, uh, for the same reason for uh, privacy policy principles to be followed. Uh, again, if you, in case if you want to enter some more data, you can click on the unlock button and you can get it up. Um, E-consent again uh, is optional and depends on the jurisdiction, you know, uh, consent process, but uh, is also possible to obtain some e-consent process. Um, then as you can see here, um, the whole data entry goes through the patient pathway. So from pre-procedure, uh, you can go and you can enter some basic data again, you can see obstetrics is chosen as default, of course, and uh, all the stars are mandatory fields. Um, all these data are basically you choose, uh, you know, which can help in influencing the outcome, you know, whether multiparasol numbers. And then comorbid condition, as you can see, they're all default no. If they are yes, you can click yes. Same with obstetric conditions, fetal conditions, if known, you can click yes or no gestational term, cervical dilatation, you know, and onset of labor. Then, you know, of course, there are different types of uh, labor analgies here, but our main focus is on uh, central neuroaxial block, but you can always choose these things. It will be a good data to identify because some patients may, uh, may be on nitrous oxide, then go on to have a central neuroaxial block, may have received a shot or two of uh, opioids and then go on to do a central neuroaxial block, so on and so forth. So if we choose central neuroaxial block, um, and you can see uh, maintenance of clinical standards is important. So there is a question which is mandatory whether you have all these standards being met. Um, this is a demo version. So I'm just going to do one or two just to show how this easy it is to enter data, you know. Um, so you can say term, dilatation, three to seven, that's when you've done. Uh, whether the labor was spontaneous and induced. So possibly, you know, I gave a little bit of opioid and we also tried tense and then we'll proceed to save. So once this is saved, the next step, uh, this will show all the data that you have entered. You can uh, just check and verify. Then the part goes for the procedural data entry. As you can see, uh, we have chosen four uh, CNBs. If the CNB is not checked, this will not show up at all. Uh, it will just quickly go into. So if you've done an epidural, you can click on the epidural um, just choose the date and time. You can do a retrospective data entry. Um, if you have got some information about a patient which was done, you know. So considering um, today's date, I'll just put it that time. I'll just put current time, you know. Um, done by, uh, you know, whether consultant or a trainee, uh, you know, whether the consultant is a junior consultant or a senior consultant, you know, all these things which can influence outcomes, supervision, whether done independently or not. Now, did the patient end up being a bit sedated while you did or was awake? Uh, patient position, you know, um, then what kind of asepsis was done? Um, and once you go through this several times, this becomes quick. 
and also we'll be implementing some of the smart features which will help with uh, quickly analyzing you know how the um, you know landmark was it palpable then you can just choose where you did the epidural uh, and then you can see this is automatically chosen whether you used ultrasound to identify what type of um, you know needle was used you know and uh, what size was used and so on and so forth okay well, well you know basically it's all about procedure what you did you know uh, you can just choose um as you can see it's not mandatory but it will be good uh, if you can enter this data if you want to do a like a proper uh, prospective observational database study it will be a good thing to have this uh, enter as much as uh, possible you know whether you gave a test dose or not then um, choose a regimen whether it is continuous intermittent or uh, if some places have the pcea uh, so we choose you know i can choose intermittent bolus then choose the local anesthetic that's been used with or without adrenaline you know uh, choose the concentration and then choose how much mils in total and you can see you know the milligram is finally automatically calculated you can either add this or that and the other data is automatically collected um, then you can choose what uh, adjuvant you used you know into the epidural space how much dose you used whatever you know um, if you use any of those you can take was there any further analgesic supplementation done or not you know um, so whether inhalational or iv uh, with, were there any technical complication if you click the slider it is yes so then you can choose any of these um, were there any acute complications during the block you know um, or immediately what was the success rate the definition of success is written here i've just used some standard success from the uh, literature you know where complete success is analgesia with pain score reduction of more than 75 percent within 45 minutes and all those things and you can always uh, choose how quickly was the onset and um, what levels you achieved if possible you know whether the high level and the lower level you know uh, what levels in you know, again this is optional uh, you can use both sides you know and uh, you can uh, enter this data what level of bromage you achieved did you require any vasopressor yes or no so it's um, graphically nicely represented and all your data is saved in this way and of course post procedure is also important how long the labor lasted what is the first stage second stage and what was the fetal outcome if you know uh, post procedure what was the pain any nausea vomiting sedation did you need to give any supplemental uh, any analgesic supplementation um, now once uh, post procedure is completed this data will now be available for analysis so until then um, the data won't be uploaded into the database for analysis now all data that goes into the database are all anonymized so that nobody can view anyone else's data okay um, so you can do this way and uh, you can enter uh, all the data outcomes whether normal or whether uh, you know was there instrumental delivery you know fetal outcome and rest are all optional so uh, you can save now this once these three are ticked pre-procedure procedure and post-procedure this data is analyzed now follow-up and feedback is optional you know uh, you can enter it yourself uh, or you can enter it manually the feedback or you can send an e-feedback where an email goes to the patient and when the patient completes the survey the data automatically comes and lands in its place uh, which will be available for analytics at any point of time if you want to look up your data you can always go to the clinical databases and audits you go into reports and analytics so you can look into the reports um, so the reports are pretty much standardized again basic descriptive statistics at the moment um, you choose a date range and uh, all the different sections you know from basic demographic uh, to procedural data to you know post procedural outcome analytics and uh, uh, patient related experience analytics all are available in graphs and charts 
Now, just be, because I don't have any data here, so I won't be able to show anything probably if I just have to show only one case will be there. Um, this is in a demo section. Um, so basically you get all the reports, you know, you can see how many cases were there, how many complete entries were there, you know, in how many cases the, you know, safety outcomes analyzed, you know, procedural outcomes, all those things. You can also look at everything. What is the local anesthetic you used? What is the procedural details? So the best part is you can save this all as PDFs or images. You can use it for your future presentations and um, you can uh, have a complete data. And as a central database, you know, uh, when we've got large enough data, we will be able to come out with some meaningful recommendations. You know, currently, I don't think so. There are any set standards in India. Am I right, Manila? So you're mute. Yeah. Regarding regional anesthesia or? Yeah, like labor analgesia. You know, if somebody wants to do an audit of their practice, you know, we always compare to the set standards, you know, um, whether beat outcomes, you know, whether, uh, you know, the concept the of uh, audit is still very much uh, rudimentary, you know. So uh, it's usually anesthetists, if anything, we just use uh, those of us who are from the UK, we follow one of mm. those things and we compare it with that because if we make the policies, then it's easy to compare here. But with yeah. regards to national standards, I think it's, as you say, the yet to be your. Uh, yeah, so that's why I urge everyone who do labor analgesia, be it an occasional uh, uh, somebody like me who does very rarely or somebody who does it on an everyday basis, you know, more the data is there, uh, you know, we can have national benchmarks set up with such national database, you know, we will have some uh, value in data where uh, case entries are in thousands, you know, where data entries are in thousands of cases. And uh, of course, uh, the value of large data. So keeping a logbook and actually keeping track of complications and actually asking for patient satisfaction. I don't know why people are so uh, hmm. not for it. <laughs> That's good. I think it's, it's a good. typical it's tendency. I hope it changes to the upcoming generation. So I think that's the only way forward to analyze and make things better, to make it more objective and subject and again again you can't you can't just be saying that i do 10000 yeah. cases a year but you have got nothing to present yeah. but if you i got a log book you can say here is my log book anybody can go through you can actually have thing otherwise why why will people believe you just yeah why why isn't indian data actually considered to be you know authentic because they, they think that they're not people are not entering they're not they're, what are they talking is, is just probably made up uh, thing. So if you need to have authentication, then you need to actually have a log. Of okay. all Look, I, I just want to say one thing. People should have developed some confidence. You know, mm -hmm. Basically, it should come from within that I need to improve my practice. I need to know, you know how I'm doing, uh, how I can improve, how I can be better. You know, I would leave it at age. You know, The whole idea of this uh, Global Anesthetic Society is uh, safe surgery, safe anesthesia, right? Um, so it's all about this. And I just want to kind of, uh, you know, we have provided a platform, you know, um, we don't want to feed everyone directly. There is this platform available. Uh, if everybody uses it, it will be fantastic too. That's all I want to say. We can Thank probably you. liaise with some of the institutions, you know, who are actually you know, willing to you know, one or two institutions to begin with, I think if they start presenting data, then, we, you know, the, uh, it, it will be more, uh, you know, obvious, you know, big ones like, you know, medical colleges, uh, large, they have so much information and they just don't present in the meetings. And I feel like, oh my God, you do so many cases and you don't present them. Exactly. There's such a wealth of uh, cases. I mean, clinical material is so plenty here. Yeah. We just Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so that's why, look, I, I'm sitting here. I can't do much about you can, this. Yes, but you uh, can your, be our colleges, your alma mater, our alma mater, you know, something like that. I think we can start somewhere like that and see. That's why uh, I'm starting to approach and uh, yeah, we'll take it. Yeah, I think um, that's been uh, very valuable. And uh, I think uh, one of the uh, greatest advantages 
of having a logbook like that. This is all, uh, uh, you know, built in artificial intelligence. So once you start putting in data, once it recognizes a pattern, it actually auto, automatically actually fills up the data for you. So it it's actually becomes easier and easier as you keep entering the data. The more data you enter, the better uh, is your you know outcomes and results which you can present. And uh, again, they also provide the graphs and tables and things, which then they don't have to worry about preparing separately. And they can just export them to their presentations. So there is a greater advantage of using this logo. I think it's been a wonderful session. And uh, I think, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Tamil. Thank you, Poonam and Vanilla, of course. And uh, thank, you, thank you, Guru, for joining us as well. Um, and I think have a, <laughs> there's not, I think, much, <laughs> much time left in India to actually enjoy. I think, yeah. Sorry. No, no, that's what. No, no, no. I, I told you just before starting this, uh, this, this India Sri Lanka finals. I think it finished before uh, Poonam finished her presentation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That that's that's good Sorry. to know that uh, okay, India won. Okay. So, uh, right. Okay. Good night, Guru. Thank Enjoy you. your time Thank to sleep much. and uh, good evening you. to all of you. Thank See you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you. Yeah.